Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's webcast on loneliness. This webcast is brought to you by the Chartered Banker Institute and CISI, the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. Please note that we are recording the webcast and it will be available to watch on demand shortly afterwards. If you would like to ask our panel any questions, please submit them via the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We hope that you enjoy today's session and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I will now hand over to today's chair, Anastasia Vinokova, who will start the session. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you so much, Emma, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webcast. My name is Anastasia. I'm Head of Workplace Wellbeing at City Mental Health Alliance UK, um, but I'm also a very passionate mental health advocate, so I was very excited to have been asked to chair this session. Um, I sit on a subcommittee of the Board of the Samaritans, which is a suicide prevention charity, and I'm also a trustee of the new uh, mental health charity, which looks at trying to ease some of the burden on NHS um, resources around mental health by providing accessible therapies to individuals nationwide. Um, and in in the interest of, I suppose, transparency on the topic, um, I come from this with lived experience. So um, I have struggled with my mental health in the past, and it's really been a big catalyst for me to try and support others who might be going through the same. So I think it's fantastic that we've got this webcast, which is focused on mental health and loneliness, and that generally Mental Health Awareness Week this year had a theme of loneliness, because unfortunately, I think we don't seem to talk about it enough. And it's quite a stigmatised topic. I think there are lots of stereotypes about what we think a lonely person might look like. Um, and we find it difficult to talk about loneliness. And, and I've been trying to reflect in advance of this webcast on, on why don't we talk about loneliness as much as we should. And I think it comes down to it being really vulnerable and raw and human experience. And it can be difficult to kind of, you know, share that with others. But it's surprisingly common, um, you know, I think it's not necessarily amongst the demographics that we might expect. And so something that hopefully you will take away from the session is that if you're feeling lonely, whether that's something you're experiencing now or it's something that you've experienced in the past or something you might experience in the future, you certainly aren't the only one. It's because we don't talk about it that we don't realise how many other people might be going through similar experiences. And just kind of a bit of my background before I joined the City Mental Health Alliance, I uh, worked for the Bank of England uh, for a while. So as you might expect, I like data and statistics. So before we move into kind of the, the, the main part of the session, I wanted to share some figures which I think illustrate how much kind of um, we don't realise loneliness uh, is a common occurrence. CMHA had a report around young people's mental health, looking specifically at young professionals aged between 20 to 26. And as part of that report, we looked at loneliness and mental health. And a really overwhelming majority of respondents, so 69%, reported that their mental health had suffered from the loneliness caused by lockdowns. And when we drilled into what that meant through focus groups, what we found out is that for those young people that were sharing with us that they had experienced loneliness and it had impacted their mental health negatively, it came with a feeling of embarrassment or shame. So kind of really talking to that stigma that we know exists. The ONS more broadly tells us that 45% of adults feel lonely, which equates to 25 million people. So if ever you're feeling lonely and you think, I must be the only one that's experiencing this, there's 25 million other people that might be going through something similar. And we know that loneliness can have impacts on all aspects of our lives and our well-being, but in particular on our mental health. But I'm hoping that through sessions like this and through some of the insights that our wonderful panellists will be sharing with us today, we can bring some openness to the topic, find ways to alleviate the issue, to reconnect and support those who might be experiencing loneliness. So I'm going to stop talking because I'm really excited about the wonderful panel that we've got. And to explore this topic, I am joined today by Caroline von Koning, who's wellbeing lead at Fidelity International, and Rosie Lyon, who's an executive assistant, a domestic abuse advocate, and the winner of Young Banker of the Year Worldwide, which is quite an achievement to have under her belt. So I'm, I can't do justice to our panellists today. So Caroline, can I ask you to kick off and share with us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much. As I said, I'm the wellbeing leader at Fidelity International. I joined uh, about almost a year ago and it's really because Fidelity realised um, 
that looking after the well-being of our people is just really, really important. So I've developed Fidelity's well-being strategy, um, which has four pillars. It's all about the workplace, the mind, the body, and then life. So helping people sort of thrive in all elements. And I think today we're really sort of looking at that sort of mind pillar, that mental health pillar. And it's something that's very dear to my heart. I'm also a qualified mental health first aider. And, um, you know, I think we've all experienced loneliness and mental health challenges across you know, our lifetime, particularly in the last two years. So it's something I really, really care about and want other people to more openly talk about and really end the stigma that's attached to mental illness, but also mental health in general and wider well-being um, and loneliness. Um, I'm also a mindfulness teacher and transformational coach, again, because I've just realised how much that has helped me in my own journey. Um, so really passionate about sharing that and absolutely delighted to be here and have a great conversation. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm really looking forward to hearing your insights specifically kind of around, you know, what you've learned in the world of organisational wellbeing. And Rosie, over to you. Could you share a bit about yourself, please? Yeah. Hello, I'm Rosie. I'm an executive assistant at Allied Irish Bank and I'm the winner of Young Bank of the Year Worldwide 2021 with my idea for a fairer financial future for sufferers and survivors of domestic abuse. Um, as something very personal to me as something that I experienced since winning the competition I've started to put my ideas into place not just in Allied Irish Bank but other banks uh, within the UK and Ireland which is amazing and I'm still working very hard on it all um, I'm a domestic abuse advocate um, online on my social media accounts including LinkedIn where I do a lot of raising awareness I do volunteering for 13 organisations and charities around domestic abuse that helps all genders as it happens to everybody. I'm also a mentor for the Charter Banker Institute in regards to Young Banker of the Year. So I help individuals go through the stages of Young Banker, which is really exciting this year. And I'm also now a breakup and divorce coach that specialises in domestic and financial abuse. Thank you so much, Rosie. Really excited to hear your insights as well. And I mean, I don't know how you've got time for all of that, but, um, you know, well done on, on all of the amazing work that you do. So before we kick off into kind of the, the main event into, into our discussion with the panellists, um, Emma, if I could ask you to bring up a polling question. Um, so for audience members, we've got a polling question that should be popping up on your screen. We're interested in um, understanding whether you've experienced loneliness in the past six months. Um, so if you can share with us, um, if you feel comfortable to, whether it's something that you've experienced, the answer is a yes, no, or not sure. Um, and we will just give it some time so that you've got an opportunity to let us know. And we'll have another polling question at the end of the session, which hopefully will kind of give us an opportunity to reflect on everything that we've heard. So um, hopefully everyone has had a chance to um, participate in the poll. So um, now we've got some brilliant questions for, oh, and we've got some results straight away. I wasn't expecting the technology to be so sleek. Thank you so much, Emma. So um, just bringing it back to what I was saying in the introduction, you know, I think one of the things with loneliness and mental health more broadly is that quite often we can feel like we're the only ones feeling a certain way. So even when we look at the responses that we've had um, across the poll, 70% of us, in the audience here today have said that we felt lonely in the last six months so again if you've had any kind of feelings of isolation isolation attached to that loneliness you're not the only one and hopefully even that kind of gives you a little bit of a boost that um if you're struggling with it you're not the only person who's struggling so thank you so much for, for participating in the poll and thank you emma for bringing up the results so quickly that was wonderful so to kick off you know what is loneliness? How do we define loneliness? What does it mean to you? Um, Rosie, would you like to kick off by, by letting us know what your definition of loneliness is? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I think it means so much um, to loads of different people. But for me and my personal experience, loneliness to me is all about going through an experience on your own, feeling like you're the only one going through it and you just don't know where to turn and what to do. Thank you. And, and Caroline, does that resonate with you or what does loneliness mean to you? I think it very much resonates um, with me. And I think for me, the definition of loneliness is almost the, the absence of or the opposite of connection. And I think, you know, you can be surrounded by a sea of people and feel all alone or you can be 
by yourself and in your own company or with just one other person but feel truly connected um, with yourself with natures with others and not feel alone at all so i think it's not about quantity it's about quality so really the opposite of connection or absence of connection that's loneliness for me Thank you so much, Caroline. And, and you've answered my next question as well, which is, you know, can we be alone but not feel lonely? And, and as you've rightly mentioned, you know, there are people who might be perfectly content with just one connection or on their own. Lots of us like to kind of spend time on our own and that's not an issue. But as you mentioned, it really is when, you know, you might be in a room full of people, but if you don't have those meaningful connections with others, um, you can you can feel lonely. Um, Rosie, I wondered if there was anything that you wanted to share as well about that difference between being lonely and being alone. Yeah, I agree with Caroline as well. You know, like I I enjoy time on my own, <laughs> if I'm honest. So if I'm on my own, it doesn't mean that I am lonely as such. But if when I was going through my domestic abuse experience and didn't know where to turn to, what to do, and no one that in my sort of circle of friends, family, colleagues had been through something similar. Um, I had sort of no guidance and that's when I did feel the lonely, loneliness. Thank you so much, Rosie, and thank you for sharing such a, a candid experience. Caroline, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's not just about loneliness with negative experiences I think they can be loneliness with positive experiences as well I don't know if any of you have read the book or seen the film Into the Wild and it's Chris McCandless that sort of leaves with that sort of quote as his message that he leaves behind is you know happiness is only real when shared and I think there's something about we are social beings and we thrive off connections with others and sometimes even my good news if you can't share them with someone else that might feel quite lonely too so um yeah Absolutely. Thank you, Caroline, for, for that reminder about it's not just about the negative, it's also about the positive. And I've got something to add to my reading list now as well. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, so I guess kind of broadening out into kind of more of the concepts behind loneliness, which really impacts our mental health. Um, I think there's something that hopefully, you know, will resonate with audience members that we have. But the industries in which we operate and the industries in which our audience members will be operating are known to inherently be quite stressful places to work. Um, and, you know, I think it would be helpful to understand, you know, do you have any information about kind of stress coping strategies? What are some of the ways that we can kind of, you know, perceive stress in a way that can help us to, to manage it? And, and Caroline, I know that, you know, this is something that you have kind of some good knowledge on. So I wondered if you wanted to kick off with, you know, what can we do to deal with not just workplace stress, but all of the other pressures of life? Yeah. I think with stress, it's almost like there's sort of a stress bucket and it doesn't matter what it's being filled with, whether it's, you know, work, private life, even exciting things like going on holiday and last minute planning. All of these can be stressful things, house purchasing, whatever it is. And, you know, we only have a certain you know capacity to cope with that stress and once that sort of stress bucket is full it will overflow and that's when it really sort of you know mental health challenges can come up so it's about thinking about well how can we almost sort of you know drill some holes into that bucket and let the stress go out or sort of attach a tap to it and i think there's helpful and unhelpful coping mechanisms so some people um you know they go to excessive things such as excessive exercise or overeating or drinking smoking whatever it is it might be really unhealth uh, unhelpful coping mechanisms to try to alleviate that stress but actually that doesn't really help in the long term so for me it's really about sitting with yourself and getting to know yourself and identifying healthy coping mechanisms of stress and for me personally um as I said, I qualified sort of in mindfulness and that's very much because I'm an overthinker. So I was like, I need to have a strategy and something to help myself just quiet in my mind. Um, it's also for me really about being out in nature and really connecting there. Um, I practice something called ecstatic dance, which is all about movement meditation and kind of really letting go, um, but also reaching out to a friend and talking things through. But I think it's really about knowing a what are your triggers? when may your sort of stress bucket be reaching almost the overflow um, and then being really cognizant of that and then actively just taking a pause and thinking what helps me right now and that's completely unique and different to every single person um, there are of course you know some trial and tested methods as i sort of mentioned mindfulness would be sort of one of them but it might not work for some people so it's really just knowing what do you need in that moment and what can you do 
And I think the better we know we, uh, know ourselves, um, the better we can then actually cope and respond with stress and also setting healthy boundaries. Um, for example, if it is work stress and you know you have a lot of you know deadlines coming up, whatever it is, actually speaking up and being like, you know what, I'd love to deliver this, but I know I'm going to be pushed to my limit here because I know how much I can cope and I'm actually going to set some healthy boundaries there or have a conversation with the manager and see, well, what support can we put in place? I think that's really important as well to kind of know um, and speak up before sort of your stress back at overflows. Thank you, Karen. And that's really helpful. And I think it's a great way to visualize it because otherwise, if you don't kind of have this concept of it's something that fills up, you know, you could keep adding things to your to-do list forever. And, and, you know, it kind of really pushes you towards that state of, of, you know, being stressed where all those stress is a normal part of life. There's definitely a stage at which, you know, it's counterproductive. It's not good for our health. So, um, and thank you for sharing some of the ways that you deal with, with stress um, personally as well. I'm, I'm very interested in the ecstatic dancing. I'm going to have to give that a, a Google after this session it sounds really fun um so rosie is there anything that you wanted to share around you know coping with stress is there anything that you do personally but also in the context of the workplace anything you can recommend to our audience members yeah i mean i'm not an expert but um personally for myself uh, i've tried so many different things for coping with stress anxiety um throughout probably the last couple of years um, one in work for me is very much being open and honest. Um, I'm quite an open person anyway, uh, so it's easier said than done. But um, being open and honest to say like, this is what I'm going through, or this is how I'm feeling, or that you know I've got too much work on to let your workplace actually help you with that to take some stress off of you. Um, and one thing that actually helps for me. Um, I wouldn't say it's odd, but uh, I like to have a bath, like a bubble bath. Um, that really relaxes me um, with a candle. That's just one thing that really works for me. So, yeah. <laughs> No, that's great to hear. And I think it really talks to that concept of self-care and what Caroline was saying that, you know, it will be different for each of us. So a lovely bubble bath sounds fantastic. And I'm great. I, you know, it's it's great that you found something that, that works for you. But um, thank you so much for, for sharing that insight, too. So just moving on slightly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the pandemic. And I know that we've probably all had enough of talking about the pandemic, but, you know, it's really important to consider that it has had an impact on our lives and it will kind of continue in the long term. And what we know uh, in kind of in terms of the relationship between the COVID pandemic and our mental health is that there was lots of kind of research that came out that, that told us what the impact was. So MIND, who are a mental health charity, did some research which suggested that around a third of adults and young people saw a deterioration in their mental health since the start of the pandemic. And what we also found out from lots of the research that emerged is that we had, you know, obviously we can't generalise, but different communities and different groups had very different experiences. Um, so CMHA uh, produced a report um, on mental health and race at work in, in partnership with Lloyds Banking Group, where actually what we found was that the psychological well-being experiences of, of our ethnic minority peers and colleagues were not the same as their white counterparts during the pandemic. And also the LGBT plus young people's charity, Just Like Us, found that LGBT plus young people were twice as likely as their non-LGBT peers to have felt lonely and separated from the people that they're closest to during lockdown. So we kind of know that the, the, the pandemic has had an impact um, on, on well-being and, and we're seeing that continue. I think there are definitely kind of both medium and longer term impacts. So from both of your observations of obviously the roles that you fulfill and, and kind of, you know, specifically in the context of the workplace, could you share anything that you've observed in terms of the way that the pandemic has impacted our well-being and specifically kind of, you know, around this concept of mental health and loneliness? I think... The pandemic has just accelerated everything that's sort of happening in that space, particularly looking at sort of corporate well-being. Um, and it's really, really recognised as something. I always sort of look at that sort of, you know, we've been faced with the same storm, but it was just more severe in some areas than in others. But we've all been sort of placed in a different boat and everyone sort of, you know, struggled to a different extent based on their situation and what their sort of setup was um, and the challenges that they had. But I think everyone went through a very difficult time because by nature, you know, if something is uncertain um, and unknown, um, that's a, we have that sort of fear response to it um, naturally. So I think everyone's well-being has suffered to a certain extent 
um, and mental health because we just didn't know what we were coping with. Um, but equally, I think it's, I always try and, you know, flip it to the positive. I think that awareness and the understanding and what we're doing now and the available support and the stigma, um, we've just made so much progress in that space in the last two years. So that's maybe one silver lining and one really positive thing to come out of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Caroline. I think it's important to reflect on the silver linings when we're talking about something that was, you know, as devastating um, as the pandemic. And Rosie, was, was there anything that you wanted to share around what you've observed in terms of the pandemic's impact on, on our well-being kind of in the context of the workplace? Yeah, no, in the workplace, um, obviously, I was in a different job at the time in AIB and I used to have to go in every day. I didn't work from home. Um, which was good for me when I was going through my traumatic experiences. I had people around me and there was lots of support in the department that I was that I was working in. And then obviously when we started working from home, uh, I had really bad anxiety anyway. So in a way, I thought at the time it was like a blessing in disguise. Oh, I don't need to leave the house anymore. This is brilliant. Um, but then I was overworking. It was a negative coping mechanism for me. Um, that wasn't expected of me but I think because I had the laptop I could work from home oh, I could do all these hours I can log on early I won't take the lunch break because it's not expected there's nobody there to make sure I do um yeah and then obviously just not being able to see people interact with people and yeah it does it does get a bit lonely when it when it comes down to that Thanks so much, Rosie. And that's that's a really um, great link on to kind of what I want to talk about next. And I'll, it's kind of, you know, more broadly around hybrid working, but I suppose kind of to split it up. You mentioned that kind of, you know, as as you were kind of, I suppose, hidden away from your colleagues, it made it more difficult for them to offer support. So, you know, do you have any kind of further thoughts on, I suppose, the risk around remote working? you know, hiding the signs that maybe somebody is struggling with their mental health and with loneliness specifically. And, you know, what are the things that we can do to make sure that when we are living in this hybrid world, which I think is here to stay, really, you know, we're not quite going to go back to how things were pre pandemic. How do we spot the signs? How do we kind of make sure that we are supporting our colleagues who might be going through a difficult time? Yeah, it is difficult. You know, when we first got into hybrid working, I think a lot of people in banking say that didn't do hybrid work and didn't work from home, that we struggled with changing things over. You know, we had to do new processes, new procedures. And I think the sort of interaction side on a personal level with your work colleagues kind of took a back seat. Um, at the start. Uh, AIB has always been very good to have like one-to-one -one sessions but I think when you know when it did start working from home and the pandemic and different things like that that kind of got put on hold a little bit when the department I was working in um, and I think for that when you're not interacting when you're not checking in on people that's when it's easier to hide the signs you can just say that you're fine um, and I think quite a lot of people say that they're fine um, and in regards to domestic abuse, of course, there's been lots in the news and the media um, about people that can obviously hide the signs. It's more dangerous for them working from home as well. I think just to make sure that everybody, you know, to spot the signs and to help people is to make sure you have them one to ones with your colleagues, with your management, check ins, be open and honest if you feel that you can. Um, and just make sure that you look after yourself and put yourself first. Thank you. And I, I think that's a, a really important concept. I think, you know, sometimes societally we can be made to feel that if you put yourself first, it's selfish. But of course, you have to. And especially if, you know, you ever want to extend support to others, you have to make sure that you're looking after yourself first. Caroline, was there anything that you wanted to share and, and particularly, I suppose, on, you know, if if we if we feel that maybe hybrid working does contribute to some of those kind of feelings of, of isolation and, and distance, you know, what can we do or well, what can we make use of that employers might provide to, to kind of find those reconnections and to look after ourselves, but also looking after others? Yeah, I think it's really the responsibility of the employer to kind of work with the employees to identify a hybrid working model that works for them. So at Fidelity, for example, it's 
very much part of our DNA now and it's sort of, you know, we trust you to work in the way that's best for you, your team, your our clients and our customers. Um, so we really kind of work with our managers to empower them and have those conversations with their team and identify a pattern that works for them. Um, and I think that's really difficult um, to kind of do and get right until you kind of try it out. And I know a lot of people um, after the pandemic were a little bit hesitant to come back to the, uh, to the workplace because they're kind of almost very comfortable in their little home office setup um, or they, there's that sort of fear factor almost but then when you know you do return and meet those colleagues face to face um, we've had a lot of feedback how, what an impact that actually had on people and, and their well-being so it's about getting that sort of pattern right um, but also providing that support when someone you know does choose to kind of work remotely, as you said, Rosie, just to kind of have those check-ins, check in with them and really create that culture of psychological safety where people can reach out and feel like they're not suffering in silence. Because I think it's, you know, if you have a difficult conversation and you're in the office, someone probably notices that and says, hey, do you want to grab a cup of coffee, five minutes, let's de-stress or talk about it. Um, whereas at home, you know, if you have a difficult call and you just press leave the Zoom meeting and then you sit there by yourself staring at a screen, that can feel really isolating. So that's when we need to have that culture of psychological safety where it's okay just to message someone being like, hey, do you just have five minutes? Can we just actually go on a little walking meeting? And I think it's you can feel connected even if you're not in the same room as other people. Um, just by actually virtually doing that and having these conversations or check-ins or um, wh whatever it is. And I think um, for me, what really helps me, so we're very much sort of in the office two or three days a week. Um, my team only comes in on, on Wednesday, that's sort of our team day. So you'll see some people walking behind me. Uh, I'm in the office in London today and it's really, really exciting. But on the days that I do work from home, and I know I'm, I'm an extrovert. I know I need that sort of social contact. Um, I have things in place, whether it's a gym class or a, a lunchtime walk um, with a friend or a virtual meeting where I just sort of walk and talk with someone or, you know, I'm very fortunate I get to look after my friend's dog as well um, one or two days a week and that really helps as well but I know what I need and I'm then actually allowing myself to have that as well so make sure the days where I'm working from home I'm not feeling lonely um, and the days where I'm in the office where I then might feel actually quite overwhelmed with that sort of contrast that in the evenings I then take it very easy and then allow myself to almost de-stress and kind of you know focus on, on, on my well-being so I think there's two sides to it because we're no longer um, yeah, we're either completely alone working from home or we're very sociable and busy in the office. It's almost getting that balance right um, and just kind of really, I think it's for managers and teams to work together and really reflect on what works for you and what works for them. So, Absolutely. And I, I think what I'm hearing as well is that that communication piece is important. So hopefully there are other things happening kind of in the organisational culture to make it a space of psychological safety, but the communication between reaching out to people, whether it's because you would like an interaction that would benefit you or equally, you know, we were talking about, well, what if someone's struggling and do kind of reach out to them. But I, I suppose following on from that, how, how do we have that conversation with somebody if you've spotted that they're struggling? So is there any kind of I suppose, uh, you know, Caroline, in, in your role in particular, you must kind of have those interactions with people quite frequently. So how do we go about that process of, OK, I've noticed some behaviour changes in somebody. I think they might be lonely. You know, how do you make that first step to reach out? What do you say? Because as we were saying earlier, there's lots of stigma associated to loneliness. So, you know, it can feel strange to reach out to someone and say, are you OK? You know, I think you've known you know, I've noticed that maybe you're feeling a bit isolated or something like that so any advice that you can give from from kind of your experience of how do we have those conversations yeah I think it's it's, it's really difficult to sometimes know um, if someone is struggling and I always sort of say you know if in doubt reach out and it doesn't need to be the sort of question be like are you okay or are you having a really tough time it could be a lovely encouraging way being like hey it'd be great for us to connect a little bit more and then sort of see um the other person's like yes absolutely i love that actually i've been feeling a little bit lonely that meant a lot that you reached out it could be a really sort of positive interaction as well and then you can be like oh of course we can do that more often um and that's more sort of in between colleagues i think if you are in a manager role and you are managing a team it is very much knowing what the setup of your team members is as well if someone you know has a partner and a family and children around um or is co-working or share a house sharing with other people they might by default not feel 
as lonely because there's people around them um, whereas if someone is living by themselves or their living arrangements are, are, are different um, they might have a more difficult time so it's really knowing your team members and then sort of tailoring the approach to them but equally from colleagues I think it's just having whether it's virtual or in person just reconnecting with people almost just I feel like if every single person said okay once a week I'm going to reach out to someone random that I don't usually always work with and just have a chat with them about something outside of work or build that connection I mean um, if everyone did that and everyone then gets reached out to by someone else at least once a week you know we, we can really start a positive movement there um, and obviously it helps as well with sort of network building so I think it doesn't need to be approached from that negative side but you are right it's difficult to know if someone is having a tough time, particularly when you are working remotely. So some of the things that we advise sort of our mental health first aiders to kind of spot or managers to be aware of is, you know, if there's a behavior change um, and if that's sort of ongoing and there is no explanation for it. Um, if someone always speaks up in meetings and all of a sudden it, it is always silent. Um, if someone always was very happy to have their camera on and all of a sudden they're not, maybe they're just moving house, you know, and, and that's, there's boxes everywhere, but then, you know, ask them. You know, um, and it might be completely okay, Zoom fatigue, that's fine, but just kind of really spotting that or if someone is all of a sudden working very difficult or di uh, not difficult, different hours, that could be a sign that something is going on beyond loneliness, just um, mental health wise in general. So just being aware of that, but never assume, you know, um, so and, and just have the conversation, basically don't be scared. Um, there is something really brave um, about being vulnerable and actually asking someone do you need help or support? That puts you in a vulnerable position as well. And I'm a big fan of Brene Brown um, and, and sort of in her TED talk, um, they're brilliant if someone hasn't watched them already, but sort of, you know, the power of vulnerability, it's all about vulnerability fosters connection. So it could even be you saying, hey, you know what? I'm struggling sometimes, you know, I'd love to connect. And the other person was like, yes, thank you for asking. I didn't, you know, feel like doing so when you did that for me. So. Thank you, Karen. And I love that if in doubt, just reach out. I think, you know, it, it's very much in a worst case scenario. You've reached out to someone, they're fine. You've had a nice conversation. Exactly. You know, that's where it stays. But, you know, if they are struggling, you, you never know kind of the impact that that, that kind of reaching out could have had on somebody. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's there's something about, I suppose, hybrid working where we have to put in a bit of extra effort. I think we have to recalibrate our habits to kind of forge some of those connections, because, you know, particularly if we're not in the office very often or if we're not in the office at all, you don't have those moments of you bump into someone in the corridor and you tell them about your weekend or yeah. you meet them by, you know, the coffee machine and, you know, you can have a chat about the football results from yesterday so we have to recreate some of those moments by some quite intentional and, and purposeful behavior so um thank you for for those yeah. insights you're welcome i'd love to just share uh, a personal example as well of that was course. sort of i think at the beginning of the pandemic and we all sort of working remotely at my previous um uh, previous company and I, I think we all went through a phase where we were you know kind of maybe more working comfortable clothes and I went for a run I was wearing, well, wasn't wearing any makeup you know I think we all went through different stages of caring and not caring and there was one day where I had not put, put any makeup on at all and I think I had been exercising um, and a, a colleague that I didn't know very well um, reached out to me and messaged me being like Caroline you look really tired are you okay and I was so touched and I was like, it's a bit embarrassed. I mean, I just didn't bother putting on any makeup. Um, and if that makes me look tired, so be it. But I was so proud that this sort of mental health first aid has spotted that, you know, usually I'm always, you know, I like making a bit of an effort. And that day, for some reason, I hadn't. Um, and thankfully, I was OK, but I felt so touched. And we really celebrated that as an example that he sort of, you know, it was male as well. So for a man, sometimes that can, you know, must have been like, oh, I don't want her to think, well, you know, what could be going on there but it was such a positive experience and then we was like yeah let's just get a coffee and talk it's so great to connect and thank you for noticing that there was a change in me essentially um and no i you know i just didn't wear any makeup but thank you it meant a lot and it was a really lovely interaction that could have you know ended up in embarrassment but i was like no you know what that's so positive i'm not going to be offended here at all i think that's amazing and that's what more people should be doing and again it's that sort of if in doubt reach out and it meant the world to me um so yeah Thank Don't you. That was a, yeah, it was a lovely, <laughs> lovely example. Um, and, and I think kind of really talks to, I mean, as you mentioned, the bravery of just reaching out to someone. I mean, you know, 
what's going to go wrong. I think there definitely is a fear that kind of holds us back from checking if someone's okay. And if you had had something going on, how wonderful that somebody had kind of spotted a behaviour change and, and had kind of taken the time and effort to, to reach out. Um, Rosie, I wondered whether you had any advice as well, because I suppose in, in lots of the advocacy work that you do, you also will be having conversations about really sensitive topics. So, you know, how, how would you encourage people to reach out in, in a sort of sensitive and, and supportive way? Do you have any advice for our audience members? Yeah, I fear in regards to domestic abuse, which is what I advocate and do all my work with, um, it is very difficult. It's very difficult to spot signs, especially if it's not physical, of course, um, and people aren't willing to share or sometimes they don't even realise that they're going through, through abuse. Um, so I think it is really important uh, that companies, organisations, banks, um, that they do, they raise awareness on different vulnerabilities, uh, one being such domestic abuse, like, you know, raising awareness and implementing some form of like webinar training. I did one with the Charter Banker Institute um, before on domestic abuse, because then that sort of highlights and people kind of have more of an understanding about it. Um, if someone approaches you and says that they are going through domestic abuse, it's really important just to listen, listen to their story and don't judge. Um, it doesn't mean that people are just going to instantly judge you, um, but quite a lot, there's a stigma around domestic abuse, um, especially about like, why didn't you leave? Why are you, some are still in the relationship. So it's like, why are you still in that relationship? And some people, including myself, we found, we find it quite embarrassing um at the time because it's like you know our relationships at the time is a load of rubbish um <laughs> what you know and we don't want people to think bad of us or think that we just put up with that and you know reflect on our type of person um and then also when people are going through domestic abuse just to support them if they have disclosed it um to make sure that you know you do check-ins um if they need time off to allow them to have time off like a domestic abuse policy we have one at allied irish bank that allows people to have time off flexible working and um, different things like that and then obviously signposting to relevant charities um that are amazing and that can help and that are specialized in the in the topic to help them and i think that goes for all vulnerabilities really all different i think there's around 52 vulnerabilities i think that has been established before and I think it's all the same you know raising awareness on you know posting it like you know I post things on social media and that's when I get the most you know the most interaction like some of my posts have like over 125,000 views and it's like you know all them people have read that and it's given them some form of understanding of my personal experience. Thanks, Rosie. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, you've prompted a thought there for me, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm kind of going off script a little bit. But um, I, I wonder, you know, you were talking about, I suppose, that feeling of stigma around admitting that you might be in a domestic abuse situation. And I think that that resonates when we talk about mental health. And in particular, when we talk about loneliness, we, you know, we were saying earlier that there is kind of a feeling that it's not okay to talk about it. So what are the ways that we break down the stigma? Is it having these conversations? Is it kind of, you know, posting if we feel able to, you know, how, how do we stop loneliness from being such a taboo thing to talk about? How do we normalise it? Yeah, I think there is a massive stigma on mental health. And I personally uh, think there is one for men um, in mental health. And you'll see that with different charities and different people that speak about it, that they just presume that men don't talk about it and some men don't and we encourage men to open up. Um, I do think it is all about, you know, raising awareness, you know, doing different things in your organisations to, you know, highlight things, getting guest speakers in or charities in, um, posting on social media or getting people, if they feel comfortable to, in your organisation. Uh, to share their stories because it resonates with so many people and then I do think sharing stories are so powerful um, and there is probably if not you know, I know loads of people that have gone through mental health and loneliness and I think everybody does have a short, have a story whether they want to share it or not is a different matter but yeah. Absolutely and did you have any thoughts on that Caroline you know how how do we how do we 
challenge the stigma and I, I agree with Rosie the storytelling is is really powerful but I wondered if you had any thoughts or observations yeah. as well Absolutely. And I think that's actually answering one of the questions um, that, that sort of have been asked in, 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 in the chat. So, yes, absolutely. I think it is about awareness raising in general of different conditions, uh, mental health conditions. And that was the question there. But also, as you mentioned, sort of domestic abuse, just people normalizing the conversation. Like our philosophy is always it's okay not to be okay for whatever reason, what, what, whatever the trigger is, um, and just to be honest and open about it. I do think senior leaders um, have a big role to play with that because um, people look up to those role models and if they kind of take a stance and sort of sponsor that, so having executive sponsorship for certain sort of initiatives, um, I think that's massively helpful. Um, but it's also about um, offering the appropriate training and guidance as well. Um, and particularly I'm sort of thinking as well, you know, we have a very global workforce is kind of knowing in each region what's the level of knowledge and understanding like and what are the different stigmas culturally that may be attached to something and then knowledge is power so um, for example we've just developed a mental health um, well-being workplace mental well-being training that for all our people managers and I feel like maybe sometimes someone isn't reaching out because they don't know how to or they don't know any better um, and same with loneliness maybe someone doesn't know it's okay to talk about it and raise it because they think, you know, they're quite literally alone with it. So yeah, awareness raising, um, role models, um, and then also knowledge and upskilling. There are things I would add. Brilliant, thank you for those insights, Caroline. And I suppose kind of with, with the final question before we, we head over to um, the audience Q&A, um, I'd be interested from, from both of you in kind of exploring what kind of support is available, both around loneliness, but also recognising that, you know, the, the psychological impact that feeling lonely can have on us. So from that kind of more mental health angle. So Caroline, I don't know if you want to kick off around, you know, what's out there, whether we're talking about within organisations or whether we're talking about, you know, kind of beyond the borders of, of our employers, where can we get help? Yeah. Um, so most organisations have in place an, an employee assistance programme, um, which often isn't very well promoted or advertised, because if you look at the percentage of people actually picking up the phone, it's very, very low and it's not in proportion of what we know the statistics are of people that do have sort of, you know, um, a difficult time with their mental health. So it's kind of find out um, if you're company offers, organization offers an employee assistance program. And that means it's sort of, you know, 24 seven, 365 days a year, there is someone you can speak to and you get access to sort of free counseling and advice. Um, and very often it's not understood how widely that support is. It can be work-life balance sort of challenges. It could be financial advice, anything that you might feel lonely with or alone with because you don't know the answer or you feel like you can't ask someone sort of around you, I'd say, explore that as a resource and pick up, uh, yeah, um, and, and, and pick up the phone. Um, and equally, a lot of organizations have trained up mental health first aiders. So it's kind of like a physical first aider, but sort of for the mind that help can help you signpost, um, you know, where to get help. Um, and there's so many amazing charities like Mind out there as well. Um, we'll also speak to your GP. If you feel like you do benefit from counselling, um, um, there, there is a lot of support available. But I think in general, it's just whatever it is, don't suffer in silence. Um, so just speak to anyone you sort of trust. And if there's no one in your direct immediate circle that you trust or at the workplace, um, do reach out to an employee assistance programme because that's confidential and sort of anonymous. Thank you so much, Caroline. Was there anything that you wanted to share, Rosie, about the support that's available? Uh, I think uh, exactly the same as Caroline, really. Uh, I've used the Employees Assistance Programme at AIB before, so I highly recommend it. It's very quick and easy to use, and they're very, very helpful. Um, obviously, there's lots of different charities out there. There's actually hundreds of charities. I didn't realise before how many there actually is. Um, and I always just say to people to Google for your local area, um, as well because there may be a local charity to you that specializes in what you need say for instance it's mental health help um, and then you know being being it local and small that they may be able to help you but there is the large ones like mind and things like that and if in doubt go to your employer um, because you know they have different if they've raised awareness on the topic before internally they may have signposting that they can help you with as well. 
thank you so much for sharing that so definitely a balance between you know explore what's available to you within your employer but also there are other routes kind of externally um, if you would like to seek support um i i wanted to just flag a, a couple of resources which i think uh, are are brilliant um the first is samaritan so they're a suicide prevention charity but they have phone lines that are open 24 hours a day so if you don't want to use the eap or maybe if you don't have access to it and particularly if you're kind of feeling in that crisis situation of course, if there's ever a danger to life, you should be calling 999 or getting yourself to A&E. But, you know, if you need someone to speak to about, you know, whatever you're experiencing, what you're going through, Samaritans are, are, are incredibly kind of supportive um, and, and wonderful charity. Um, and also um, what I would flag is, and, and this may not be relevant for everyone on the audience, but I'm just con uh, conscious that, you know, where... Uh, I suppose lots of you have probably heard about the event is from kind of, um, you know, the, the, the CBI and, and uh, CISI. Um, there's a charity called the Bank Workers Charity, which is a, a well-being based charity which supports um, those who work in banks, either now or previously. So if you work for a bank currently, if you've ever worked for a bank, you could be eligible for support from them. And they provide well-being support to current and former bank workers. Um, and their immediate families. So there's something about obviously our, our well-being can be really impacted by the people around us. So they offer support. They can offer counselling. They offer financial well-being support. They can offer grants support with things like um, disability allowances and things like that. So um, they're a really great charity. They are very well funded because they've been around for a long time. So they provide some good resources and information, but they also have helplines where they can support. So it might be a relevant resource to some of the audience um, members that, that are on here. But there's loads of wonderful organisations, including the NHS, but also beyond that offer lots of mental health support. So um, have a little bit of a research. And, and I think my, my kind of advice would be that you might be on this call and think, well, I don't need to know what's out there because I'm fine right now. But actually, this is a good time to find out what's out there. It's a good time to research what's available from your employer, because when you get to a stage where you're not feeling great, the last thing you want to do is go through the effort of having to find where do you get support. And equally, we were talking about, you know, spotting when others might be struggling and reaching out to them it's helpful if somewhere in the back of your mind you're aware of what's available within your employer what's available outside of your employer so that again when you're having those conversations you're trying to support you've already got a level of knowledge um, that you can kind of draw upon so um, I'm going to stop talking again and I'm going to move on to the audience Q&A. Um, I'm hoping that we answered one of the questions that we came through, which was around raising awareness and, and kind of, um, you know, how do we make people feel less alone and, and remove some of the stigma around mental health. Um, we have a really interesting question here, which I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated to hear from, from Caroline and Rosie about what they think. But um, one of our audience members has shared that they feel lonely and isolated sometimes as a result of looking on social media platforms like Instagram, particularly when they're seeing that other people seem to be achieving more than them. Um, so Rosie, Caroline, would you be able to talk about, you know, this feeling of loneliness, which can come from comparing ourselves to others and, and feeling left out? Um, Caroline, if you want to go first. Yeah, I think I, I really resonate with that question as well. Um, I think it's the day and age, it's what we do now, we compare ourselves to others. And it's easier to do that now than it ever has been with social media. So I think partly it's about putting some sort of etiquette in place for yourself and almost sort of be strict with yourself being like, if I know that this isn't good for me, let's, you know, cut down the time I'm spending on social media. Um, and really just kind of, I always feel like it's compare yourself against yourself as like, have I made progress? Where was I, you know, a month ago, a year ago, am I achieving my own personal goals? That's really who you should comparing yourself against and not other people. And I think it's very easy to think, you know, that someone's life might be perfect and they might have no challenges at all. Um, when you see a beautifully, you know, curated image with loads of filters on, um, more often than not, that's not actually the truth. And behind the scenes, um, it's very different. And maybe actually they're feeling very, very insecure and very, very lonely. And that's why they're portraying a certain image to the world because they are relying on those likes and the little hearts, you know, um, coming up because they need that validation because they're not getting that from elsewhere. So I was trying kind of just remove myself from it and being like, you're getting one picture here and one picture is never the whole story. So don't feel like, you know, you're not good enough. I think it comes from a place and be like, I'm good enough and I'm trying my hardest and I'm being compassionate with myself. Um, that's, yeah, really important. 
Thank you, Caroline. Yeah. It, I, I think it does. Rosie, was there anything you wanted to share as well on, on this concept of comparison and social media? Yeah, I, this resonates with me a lot personally. You know, when I had left my relationship, I was then on my own. Um, you know, I always wanted this, like your mortgage, get married, have children, kind of like, you know, the main thing. Um, I then had a mortgage in repossession. Um, I was now on my own. I felt like I was going back. Um, whereas all my friends were going forward, they were all getting married, they were all having children. And I was a bit like, this is what I this is what I want, and it's been taken from me. Um, and I still get that sometimes today when I'm looking at social media, I'm like, oh, they've got a lovely life. I went through all this and, you know, I was on my own and different things like that. But for me, it's like my time will come. This will come for me. Um, we're all on our own paths, on our own journey. And to me, it's to come back and remember that. And there's stuff in my life that I've achieved that is amazing that other people haven't achieved. And to me... You know, I need to think about all them things like winning Young Bank of the Year, making a difference um, in the banking industry and stuff like that. And they're the things that I need to remember that I'm so proud of. And that is my sort of path for now. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rosie. And I think kind of linking back to what you were saying earlier around self-care and, and, and Caroline, what you were saying about kind of how we engage. Um, I, I wanted to share that I went through a period of, of deleting lots of social media apps from my phone because it's very easy. You know, you're you're sat in the evening and, you know, you just automatically gravitate there. But actually, when you reflect on how it makes you feel, you know, you, you don't necessarily, you know, why do you want to keep it? It's, it? It can be quite addictive. But I think, you know, um, removing it, particularly when I was going through a period of poor mental health was really helpful. As a, it, it was a self-care thing. I just didn't want to be exposed to that um, at a time when I was feeling fragile. So I think it's something about taking control and recognizing that it's OK to step away from the things that that make us feel upset. Um, so, you know, hopefully that that kind of helps, um, you know, the, the, the person who asked the question in particular, even just to hear that all three of us have had experiences with, you know, similarly that resonate with with social media. Yeah, I think what I want to add as well is, you know, it can be a really positive experience as well. I know there's a lot of, you know, advocates and now sort of I think they influencers that are now using this for the good and actually sharing, you know, this is me non filter. I'm having a bad day. It's OK. So I almost feel like maybe you're kind of, you know. Really be mindful of who you follow. Um, and actually see that there can be some good out there as well or sort of communities that make you feel almost less alone um, because you realise you're not just the only one going through it. But I love, you know, someone commented um, in the, I think that was Laura commented um, uh, there saying, you know, don't compare your behind the scenes with someone else's showreel. And I think that just sums it up. Um, thank you for adding that, Laura. Some brilliant quotes we're getting um, on, on this session, both from the panellists and, and from our lovely audience members. Um, so just bring it back to um, uh, kind of in a, in a more focused way on specifically kind of um, loneliness um, and, and kind of isolation. Um, we have, we've had a question here around, I suppose, you know, loneliness being different for different people. So the question is, do you think that loneliness looks and feels different depending on where you are in the world, your age, your gender and other factors? So, um, you know, can it change what it looks like depending on you know who we're talking to um caroline rose i don't know if either of you had any thoughts on that i, I can reflect on it I, I don't mind um, i don't think this is going to be a scientific answer so i hope that's not what uh, this person was looking for but i think it's it, it's absolutely i think as we grow as a person our needs change and our circumstances change and um, as I said, what might feel good for one person is not right for the other. And, you know, some people are sent, um, naturally are very happy with a small community and others thrive of, you know, much more. And I think, you know, as, as we grow up, um, you know, that changes and equally, you know, with different cultures as well. You know, some are very much about the very close knit family community and large families. When someone maybe is then doesn't have that, they might feel really isolated in other cultures. It's much more normal to maybe just have sort of one child and smaller families. I think there's different norms, there's different understandings of us and different definitions of what loneliness is. And I think that's what we really need to embrace. It's, you know, it just matters what, whether you're feeling lonely yourself, not whether someone else is like, yeah, but you have all of this. And you're like, well, don't, again, is that going back to that comparison piece, you know? Um, 
what you might be happy with might not be enough for someone else and vice versa. So absolutely. Thank you. Rosie, did you want to come in on that as well? Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think everybody's journey, their path is um, completely different. Similarities, of course, but um, completely different. So I think it will always look different for other people, but they will resonate with other people that are going through a similar situation. So just coming back to what I said, like sharing stories, you know, on social media, like influencers do and other people do, like where they just share their stories and they're open and honest and then people resonate with it. And I think it's really powerful. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, and we've got another question here, which is coming back to, to, to the stigma um, around admitting to feel, feeling lonely. So why do you think that there is that stigma? Is it seen to be um, you know, an admission of failure in some way? Um, Rosie, maybe if we come to you first. Um, yeah, I, I'd say so. I would say so. Um, yeah. Caroline, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Yeah. I think, again, it's more personal opinion, but I guess it's just if you look at how, you know, the evolution, we've always sort of been sort of, you know, in packs or animals as well, then coming to, you know, you're stronger together as a pack in a community. I think that's just, you know, what it is in the animal world. And I guess sort of that's the perception sort of, you know, in our society as well. So when someone maybe doesn't have that, but wants that, um, that can really make them feel isolated and lonely. So I think there is, yeah, a little bit of, it's just what society expects of us. It's kind of, again, that sort of, you know, Rosie, to what you sort of said, it's, you know, um, the path for most people or what they aspire to is a partner, a family and this and that. And when they don't have that, they feel like they're missing out. So I think there's a bit of society expect, uh, expectations as well. And um, we often celebrate that, but we don't actually celebrate someone as, you know, I'm doing it by myself and I'm doing great. Um, I think, yeah, there is probably a bit of um, the biology and the evolution and just what we are as sort of, you know, social beings, but also the society and the pressures that are being put on us. Absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, when we were talking earlier about kind of that experience of loneliness being quite vulnerable and, you know, very personal, um, I think that, you know, there probably is stigma that comes from that kind of false perception that it reflects on you as a person somehow. But I think as a, as a reminder to kind of anyone listening on the audience, it's not a reflection on you. You know, when we look at the statistics, it is an experience that so many of us go through and you could be the best person in the world and experience feelings of loneliness. So it's definitely not a reflection on, on kind of you as an individual. So I think we've got time for one final question, um, which is um, first, there's, there's a lovely thank you to, to you, Caroline Rosie, for being so open and for, for the great discussion. Um, it's a broad question around whether you think that the financial services sector is doing enough to support people going through this, so loneliness, but also other mental health issues. Um, I'd say they they are doing they are doing things and you see it all the time in all different financial sectors uh, where they promote it as well what they're doing but I do think there's a lot more that needs to be done and there's a long way a long way to go but through raising awareness implementing that training and enhancing policies and lots of different things uh, it will improve. Yeah. I would agree with that. I think all the right things are being done, but it's almost the fact that we have to put on a webcast on this topic. We shouldn't have to do that. It should just be so normal and part of our, you know, of our everyday life that there is no need for that. So I think that's when we've truly, you know, in the financial service sector and industry have achieved that when it's just part of BAU and it's no longer a special thing. It's just part of everyone's language. We don't have to think about it twice. And until that's fully embedded, I think we still have a, have a long way to go. It's definitely a great thing to aspire to, Caroline. I, I definitely agree. And um, I mean, as Rosie mentioned, I, my observation from working with City Mental Health Alliance is that our members and also those who aren't members are, are trying. There is genuinely a lot of authentic work going on in this space, but it's a complicated topic. It's broad. There's lots of embedded behaviours that we have to change to really kind of get this right. So um, I think hopefully if, if progress continues as it's been going, we will get there and, and it will make things a little bit easier. So I think that's all we've got time for. We've got just a minute until the end. So um, I'm going to ask Emma to pull up our final polling question um, while I while I do my thank yous and my goodbyes. So we've got a, a question to, to round off here, which is, 
just around whether you feel that you'd be more comfortable talking to others about loneliness following the discussion that you've observed here today. Um, and while you're filling in um, those responses, I just wanted to say an enormous thank you to Rosie and Caroline for being so open to providing such wonderful insights. It's been an absolute pleasure sharing the session and hearing um, everything that you've had to share. Thank you so much to audience members who have joined us today. And I really hope that the um, session was as exciting for you as it was for me. Um, and a huge, huge thank you to Emma behind the scenes who has been wonderful at making sure that this has all been running smoothly for us. And um, our lovely poll results are up there. And um, so we're really, really thrilled that um, uh, the majority of our audience members do feel more comfortable talking to others about loneliness following this conversation. So I think that that's um, a, a really great um, kind of success from the session. But take care, everyone. Thank you so much for joining and have a fabulous rest of the day.